Welcome to the Investing Ahead podcast. I'm Tom Curran. It seems like uh, a long time ago, but it was only about 25 years ago, I decided to begin my own firm. After working in Wall Street, big firms uh, with lots of employees for most of my career. I like to say that in starting my own firm, I think I learned a lot about what I should not do, but I needed to commit and have the discipline to do what I knew I needed to do in order to help people like you, clients, uh, maximize their ability to achieve their financial security. I like to tell a story here about when I was a young man, I was still in graduate school at uh, Wharton at the University of Pennsylvania, and I was on a, an internship. And the internship happened to be in uh, Media, Pennsylvania, and one lunchtime I went out and wandered into a brokerage office. The name of the firm was Byron and Company. Long, long time ago they went out of business. And I met a, a person who showed me a long-term chart of an investment in a mutual fund that we call the mountain charts that grew to what I thought was an enormous sum of money. It was a $10,000 investment that grew, over, grew to over a million dollars over a period of time. And it triggered something in me. And I said, that's what I want. I, I, I need a plan in order to do that. Uh, I had just recently gotten married. Uh, I had no money. And I, I decided that based on that chart, if I could do what that chart demonstrated, I could have a million dollars by the time I was ready to retire. Now, let's put this in perspective. A million dollars in 1969, 1970 had the purchasing power of about six million today. So a million dollars, it was a lot of money in those days. And I decided that if I could get $10,000 by the time I was age 32 and could allow that to compound at 10%, which is a long-term rate of return in common stocks, which was demonstrated in that mountain chart, I'd have a million dollars by the time I retired in age 65. What I needed was $10,000. I had nothing. I had no money at all. I had just gotten married, just graduated. Uh, by the time I put my plan together, I had no money. So I said to myself, I need to get $10,000 by the time I'm 32, 33, approximately 10 years from that time. So I committed myself to achieving that $10,000 goal because I was confident that if I could do that and just let it be, I would have a million dollars. Now, as it turned out, uh, once I set my mind to it, I achieved that $10,000 goal in my late 20s. And the rest is history. Uh, I made a multiple of that because I learned the secret of compound returns and compound interest and what that can do. And that's one of the things that Wall Street doesn't do at all. It sells products up 10%, earn 5%, get 20%. And that, in the long run, is not going to help you. In the long run, we have to understand making money takes a long, long time. The key to financial success is time and not timing. So I learned from that. I did it. And I wish I could remember the name of that person who showed me that chart because I owe him a tremendous amount of gratitude for what he told me. And my goal is to try to share with you some things that will help you achieve your dreams. The first thing I have to tell you, though, is if we do it the way everyone else does it, uh, we're probably going to get the kinds of results everyone else gets. And that will be uh, not, not satisfactory, I think, in most of our minds. I started out by admitting immediately that the million dollars that I envisioned in 1969, 1968, is not a million dollars today. It's more like six million today in order to have the same purchasing power. 
So we have to recognize that whatever our future goal is, if we measure it in current dollars, it won't be enough by the time we really need it. And the other thing we have to understand is that in looking at money, if we spend it, the biggest enemy of achieving wealth is spending the money. I talk to so many people and they say, well, what, what good is money if I don't spend it, if I can't use it? What good is it? And it makes me try, and I don't think I've done really a very good job of it over the years, is to explain to, to people, to clients, that income is one thing, wealth is quite another. And achieving income is associated with the jobs we have. It's associated with how hard we work, how many hours we work. So, in, and it's also associated with how successful we are and what kind of career we have. But no matter who we are or what we are, we have to achieve wealth to support the lifestyle that we become accustomed to during our working years. For someone who lives comfortably on 50,000, 75,000, 100,000, what they need to achieve isn't nearly as much as the wealthy person, maybe, or I should say the income-rich person, making $500,000 a year. So we have to keep in mind that what we're trying to support, what we're trying to achieve, achieve in financial security is a function of what we need. Now, when I went out to do that, I had no idea what I would be making when I retired. I knew what I was making when I had that goal. I was making about $6,000 a year. $6,000 a year. Graduated from Wharton, $6,000 a year. My wife graduated from Temple. Uh, she became a teacher. She was making $4,800 a year. Now, immediately when I was thinking in terms of my future financial security, I was thinking in terms of, 6000 a year, 4800 a year. Think about it. The starting salary for college graduates. I don't know what it is for a Wharton grad, Wharton MBA. But college graduates now make fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year right out of college. So we have to think ahead. In my book, I refer to it as investing ahead. We have to not only look at where we are today, but we have to ask ourselves, what is that going to mean for me when I'm 65? Along the way, there are a number of obstacles. One of them is the pressures we all feel to live, enjoy life. And all of that involves consumption. I like to tell people you can only spend a dollar one time. One time. Whatever you spend the dollar for, it's gone. Let's think about this. What's the value of a dollar? In today's terms, a dollar is not very much. Doesn't even buy a cup of uh, coffee. And now let's play a little game. I like to ask people a silly question. What would have happened if you had a penny? Your forefathers, you were, they came, on the, they came to uh, America on the Mayflower and you had one and they took a penny in 1776 and invested it for your, on your behalf. What would that penny be worth? If it was invested in one or two or three percent securities, it would be worth a couple dollars today, hardly worth it. If it was invested at five percent back in 1776, it would be worth in the thousands. But if it was invested, that one penny, nothing added to it, from 1776, it would be worth more than a hundred million dollars today. Now, the reason why people don't really achieve financial security is because they expect low rates of return to do something it hasn't done in the history of our country. They expect somewhat higher returns to achieve something that can't simply be done at 5%. And because of an inability or a misunderstanding about what it means to invest at 10%, over time and what that may mean for your financial security, 
is lost. So between low rates of return, not taking risks, not understanding returns, and consuming, most people find it impossible for obvious reasons to achieve financial security. What I like to tell young people in particular is one of the things you have to understand and accept is, yes, you can be smart, you can work hard, you can work long, long hours, but absent risk, the returns you can expect are minimal. And let's take a look at risk. When we have young people in front of us and we're talking to them, we say, you've got a long time horizon. Invest in stocks. Invest in higher return securities. Accept short-term volatility because the rewards are so great. Time does offset volatility. Once we take 10-year returns, 20-year returns, 30-year returns, the volatility that we feel so acutely when the market goes down is lost. If I were to show you that mountain chart, if I were to show you any long-term chart for securities, for stocks, and took an inception date of, let's say, 1970, and showed it through today, you'd look at it and you say, wow, I really do want that. Because in the longer term, all those downturns, all that volatility, all that risk that we seem to be ultra sensitive to gets lost. You don't see those declines over 30, 40 year periods. They're not there because relative to the longer term, they are nothing more than blips. But when we live through them, when we experience them, we become seriously afraid and seriously risk averse. And we avoid, procrastinate, don't do what history tells us has worked over and over and over again. When I speak to older retirees, they look at me and they don't dispute what I say, but they do say, well, it's too late for me. And when they talk to you, their grandchildren, their children, they're urging you to do what? Invest, save, look at the long term. And I think lots of times what we're trying to do is help our um, younger generation do what we didn't do, and we encourage them to do what we didn't do. And that gets me back to the older person who says, it's too late for me. It's never too late. We don't want to make the same mistakes in retirement that we made when we were accumulating money. We don't want to say it's too late because we're retired and we didn't do when we were uh, 22, what we should have been doing. So now we're retired. What do we do? We need to understand a couple of things. And I think for retirees, one thing that we should all be very, very uh, sensitive to, and I am not retired. I'm surely old enough to retire, more than a few years old enough to retire, but I love working, so I continue to do it. But the one thing we have to understand is inflation is a big issue for all of us. And that for the last 30, 40 years, inflation has been running at rates less than the long-term average. The long-term average inflation is about three and a quarter, three and a half percent. In the last 10 years, it's been down in 2% range. Going forward, since the pandemic anyway, we've seen higher inflation rates. Inflation is a long-term phenomenon. It tends not to be short-term. The stock market is a short-term cycle. Stocks go down in the short run, but in the long run, they go higher. And that's been the case for as long as we've been able to measure stocks. Inflation is a long cycle phenomenon. It is not, while it's bad, it doesn't go away in the short run. So we had 9% inflation a year ago. Now we have three and a half, four percent. The question is, what's it going to be for that person who's retired going forward? If you do it the safe, secure way, the way it seems to make sense, except two, three, four percent, and spend five percent, because most retirees take five percent of their money to support their lifestyle, 
if you take 5% out and lose 3 or 4 or 5% to inflation, you're falling behind very, very fast. People say to me, well, I can't afford to take the risk of stocks. I'm retired. Well, no, you don't want to be 100% in stocks. But if you're 100% in a CD at 3% and we have 5% inflation and you're taking 5% out to live, you're going to run out of money. For sure. The only way to offset that is to have a balanced portfolio of stocks and bonds. The pension funds that some of you enjoy receiving a check from each month, they're not invested overly in fixed income. Typically, they have 60% or more of their investments in securities that can grow. So for the retiree, they need investments that can grow as well. But remember, as a retiree in today's world with 401ks, IRAs, you're responsible for your retirement. There is no one sitting behind a desk in the state capitol or anywhere else investing that money for your behalf, having it 60 to 70% in stocks, whether that's the way you would do it, doesn't really matter. They're doing it because that's the prudent way to do it. So we as retirees, older folks, we have to understand that and we have to be in control and command of that investment for our own behalf. So it gets back to, did we do when we, what we should have done when we were younger? I'm afraid to say my experience is most of us do not. My experience with most younger people is they're delaying, procrastinating far too long. My experience with seniors is they repeat mistakes they made in prior years, uh, thinking it's too late now. It's never too late. I think we have to do what we have to do and that the key to investment, the key, it's not intelligence. It's not, not how smart you are. It's how disciplined you are and how disciplined you are in deferring consumption, understanding that in retirement, income no longer matters. You don't have a job any longer. You have wealth or you have not wealth. It takes wealth to support income and retirement. And I want to leave you with this number. What does it take to buy a cup of coffee? Well, maybe $3 if you're working. A fraction of an hour of the time you spend earning your income. But what's it take to support a $3 cup of coffee when you have no income? You're, re you're relying on your retirement income. It takes $60 to support that $3 cup of coffee. And I like to call it the rule of 20. Multiply whatever it is you want to buy by 20 when you're retired. That's how much wealth it takes to support it. Why 20? It's 5%. You need a 5% return. In order to get $3 off a 5% return, it takes $60. Now, think about that. Everything you spend as a retiree takes 20 times that to pay for. It's not a job anymore. It's not an hourly wage. It's not an annual wage. It's wealth and the importance of supporting and building wealth is very, very apparent once we stop working. And that wealth has to support us, not for one year, not for two years. We tell couples that if they're, a couple is alive at age 65, one of them is likely to live to 90 or more. We're talking about many, many years. Now, let's stop and think about that again for a minute. If we want to spend money every time we buy something, let's say we were going to buy a car for $50,000. It takes a million dollars to get that money to buy a $50,000 car. 
it's astounding and frightening, but that's what it takes. We all know that. We all understand it, but that's what it takes. It takes a lot to support us when we're older. It takes a lot to support us when we're younger. When we're younger, if we don't understand that we have to set aside for the future because we no longer have income from employment, we must have income from wealth. And we have to think in terms of how much wealth does it take to support every dollar we spend? Keeping in mind, we can only spend a dollar once. And that's why it's so very, very important to conserve and keep as much of the wealth as we can so that we can support as much as we can when we no longer have a living wage. In my book, I refer to squirrels. And I laughingly, kiddingly say, if we were squirrels, most of us would be dead. We have to store up for the winners. We have to discipline ourselves to spend a little bit less so that we can have more throughout our lifetime. I thank you for watching this podcast. This is Tom Curran. Goodbye with thanks. Thank you for watching and listening to the Investing Ahead podcast with Tom Curran. Look for the Investing Ahead book and audiobook available everywhere. Executive producer Brendan Kennedy, directed and produced by John Wager, engineered and edited by Adam Russell and Aidan Fitzsimmons, filmed and recorded at Galileo Media Arts Studios. Copyright 2024 Thomas Curran. All rights reserved. For more information, visit investingaheadpodcast.com.